Hello, everybody, and welcome back for another week in Principles of Marketing. Um, this week, we are moving on to discuss consumer behavior, which is one of my favorite topics and something that I studied pretty extensively in graduate school, so I'm excited to share this with you. Um, some essential questions for today's lesson. Um, the, the really big takeaway is I want you to know the steps in the consumer decision process. So that's our first essential question. Um, I'd also like for you to be able to differentiate between psychological and functional needs, and that is the topic you're going to see this week in your discussion board assignment. Um, I'd also like for you to tell me which factors specifically affect this consumer decision process and how we define involvement, um, not in the sense of the real world, but in uh, the marketing world. How, what do we mean when we say involvement? So uh, those are the questions I'm hoping you can answer by the end of our lecture today. Um, as we get started, I want to talk about consumers, and I'm not sure about you, but um, as as an individual, I'm pretty pretty unpredictable and pretty irrational whenever it comes to shopping and making choices, and, and most consumers are that way. We don't always have um, an explanation for our choices or our actions. We don't always have um, a plan. Sometimes we just buy things, and that's what makes studying consumer behavior so interesting because... Um, marketers have to work very, very hard to predict these behaviors and gain an understanding of their consumers before we're able to plunge forward in making marketing decisions. So consumer behavior is very important, something interesting and also very fun to understand. Um, so as I said, consumer behavior is all about the why, um, the why behind people buy goods, the why behind people buy services, uh, why do we do what we do, and you spent just a couple of weeks ago in your discussion boards talking about value and you had to pick items and um, I saw everything from Louis Vuitton purses to toothpaste in, in your discussion boards and I really enjoyed reading those. Uh, but the common theme in, in each of those areas is that um, usually we buy one product over another because it's a better value for us as consumers. And, and maybe that means that you buy Crest 3D white toothpaste instead of Arm & Hammer because you, uh, you know, it's the same price but you get whitening benefits or, or whatever it may be. Um, but in each of those cases, um, the product had more benefits than cost for you, which is uh, how it created value in that sense. So um, I want to start out with today's lecture by kind of setting the scene for you, giving you a little example, and I'm going to keep coming back to this throughout uh, the video lecture and keep referencing this, but uh, we're going to talk about Katie, okay? Uh, Katie just got her dream job. She's super excited, or, or she hasn't gotten the job yet, excuse me. She's she's getting ready to interview. She's super pumped, and she uh, is a little nervous. You know how it goes when you're, you're just graduated, getting excited. Um, so anyway, she needs to purchase an outfit that she can use for this interview. She wants it to be uh, professional, but she also wants it to be stylish. She wants it to be a good investment, um, yet also she doesn't want to pay a lot of money. So you're, she's kind of asking for a lot, but these are um, the things that Katie is hoping to find in an interview outfit. And we're going to keep talking about Katie, so keep that in mind. Um, recent grad, looking for a job, interviewing for her dream job, looking for an outfit, okay? So I'm going to use this scenario with Katie to talk to you about the consumer decision process. And I'm sorry, I realized I did not have this full screen. That might be better for you to see now. Um, we're going to use this situation with Katie to talk about the consumer decision process. And these are essentially just the steps that consumers go through not only during the decision process, but also before and after as we're making these purchase decisions. So uh, obviously the first thing is Katie needs to recognize a need. So, and, and this is the same for all consumers. So we have some kind of discrepancy between uh, two states. And this is where we find our need recognition. We have some kind of unsatisfied need that we need to fulfill. Um, and generally speaking, the larger the difference between your actual state and your desired state results in um, a, a drive and initiative to, to kind of satiate that desire more quickly. And uh, I always like to think about the example of hunger. I don't know about you guys, but I get kind of hangry when I'm when I'm hungry and I want to eat. I get angry, and I so uh, my actual state, you know, I'm hungry is not the same as my desired state, my, my full or my not hungry state, right? So there's this discrepancy and, and the the more that discrepancy grows, the, the more that um, there's a disconnect between my actual and my desired state, in, in this case, the hungrier that I get, 
uh, the more that I want to quickly satisfy that desire, the more that I will just, you know, eat the table, right? So your need recognition is, is simply stated that way. It's a discrepancy between the two states, okay? Um, underneath need recognition, we're going to talk about wants, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but um, to talk about wants under the needs category, but it, it'll make sense in just a moment. Um, we define wants just as you would think as goods or services that we don't need, but that we desire. Okay. Um, and, and this is important when we talk about marketing, because if you're craving just a super awesome piece of cheesecake, you want that Oreo cheesecake, graham cracker crust, lump of goodness inside of your stomach. If you're really craving cheesecake, some, some slices of fruit just is, it's, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to be good enough because you want cheesecake. You don't want fruit, right? So um, our needs as consumers are similar to that cheesecake fruit example. You can classify our needs as either functional needs, psychological needs, or they can fall in both categories. Um, and remember, this is the topic of your discussion board this week, so please make sure you pay attention to this part. Um, and I I thought back to your all's discussions that you did the very first week, the chapter one and five discussion where you had to name a product. And a lot of you guys talked about vehicles, you talked about purses. And so I want to use some examples that are um, relevant for you as I describe functional and psychological needs, because I think that'll help you differentiate between them. Um, so a functional need uh, really just pertains to the performance of a product or a service. So if we're talking about a purse, um, ladies, you need purses so you can carry your money, you can carry um, anything you need to take to class. You know, it, it's, its function is to carry items, right? Well, that would define your functional need, but a lot of you guys don't just buy a cheapo little, you know, $1 purse because of psychological needs. Um, and, and these needs pertain to more of like personal gratification, um, happiness that you associate with a product, more or less. And the best example, um, you know, you don't buy a traditional purse again, maybe not a dollar purse, maybe you buy a Michael Kors purse, or you buy a um, Louis Vuitton, okay? So you're looking at your psychological needs whenever you're looking at Michael Kors purses. But whenever you're looking at just a regular purse to carry your items from point A to point B that you might buy at Walmart or Kohl's, you're fulfilling more of a functional need. Okay, uh, the same is true with a vehicle. Uh, we need a vehicle to get from point A to point B. So you can buy a Toyota, a used Toyota maybe, to get from point A to point B. Um, or you can buy, a, uh, satisfy, satisfy your psychological needs and buy a Lexus or a BMW, right? So there's a difference. And marketers have to think about these functional and psychological needs as we market our products to um, have those different target audiences in mind. So... Um, the key takeaway here is that there is a successful balance between these two needs. And a really good example of this is H&R Block. You know, it's, it's tax season. We all want to get our taxes done. Maybe you're expecting a big refund. I don't know. Um, but H&R Block markets um, to individuals who obviously need to have their taxes done. They are a tax service. And um, they do satisfy a functional need in that they complete your taxes. You Everyone has to pay taxes, right? And we're going to go to jail, okay? So your functional need is going to be met. You need your taxes to be paid and your taxes to be um, turned in and all that. Well, they also market to your psychological needs with what we call puffery. And if you study advertising or, or you get into marketing in more detail, you'll, you'll learn more about puffery. But uh, really, they're, they're marketing to your psychological needs by saying, hey, um, we're going to give you the best tax return ever, the absolute largest tax return you could possibly imagine. Um, and in saying that, they're marketing to your psychological needs, trying to get you the best tax return. Okay, so there, there's a dual role here to be set. Um, so once we have identified our need and passed through this need recognition step in the consumer decision process, we head on over to information search, okay? And um, the way that we search for information is different for every product, uh, but generally it has to do with the degree of perceived risk, okay? So the, the riskier your purchase, the longer you're gonna spend searching for um, items, and generally the more intense your search will be, okay? And I'm gonna give you some examples uh, there's two different types of information search. We have the internal search for information 
and we have an external search for information. Um, when we do an internal search for information, we typically do not um, spend as much time or as much effort. We're just thinking about our own past experiences, our own knowledge about the product. Um, so it's not as intensive a search, it's not as long of a search. An example is, you know, if you're really hungry and you want barbecue, um, you know, I'm from the Tri-Cities and, and here in the Tri-Cities area, we have a barbecue restaurant called Ridgewood Barbecue that is just really well known for their barbecue. So, you know, we don't put a lot of time into it. We think, oh my gosh, we want barbecue. Let's go to Richwood. Or you want cheesecake. Okay, let's go to the Cheesecake Factory. You want a steak. Oh, let's go to, to Chop House. Um, you may not put a lot of effort into it because maybe you've had a, pest ex a past experience. You've tried Ridgewood's barbecue. You've had a steak from Chop House. You've had a piece of cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory and it was just so delicious. <clears throat> Automatically, that is where you want to go. That's an internal search for information. Um, and in other cases, we may conduct an external search for information, and this is usually for more serious decisions. Um, let's say my dishwasher breaks and I need to take it apart. Uh, maybe I pick up the phone and call my dad and say, Dad, get over here. I need help with this, right? That's what I would do. Or, um, you know, maybe I, I Google and I watch a YouTube video and see how to fix the dishwasher, okay? Um, or when you're buying a car, maybe you look at the Carfax or the Kelly Blue Book. You're, you're searching for information in a way that is not just in your own brain. You're going elsewhere. You're asking people. You're reading things online. You're getting information from outside sources, um, just like when you guys write your papers every week. You're, you're not just using information that's internal to our class. You're going out and looking in scholarly journals and finding these, this other information to support what you're trying to say. That's an external search for information. Okay, so we've covered both of those. Um, uh, in this subset, under the search for information, I want to talk to you a little bit about some, some factors that affect the search process. Um, and we're going to start with perceived benefits versus perceived cost. So um, think about whenever you buy your first home. You guys are going to be graduating soon, doing that um, sooner than you know. Um, but as you are buying your first home, um, this is an area where you're probably going to conduct an external search for information. Okay, you're probably going to talk to your parents about it. You're probably going to have a home inspection done. Um, you're probably going to do a lot of research, talk to the bank. Uh, most of you guys probably will have to have a mortgage because you may not have $100,000 laying around at the bank, right? So all this being said, you're doing an external search for information as you buy your first home uh, because you have a lot of costs. There's a, there's a lot associated um, with buying a house and it is worth the time and the effort to search for the information because if you mess up or you buy a house and your floor collapses the next year and you're still stuck with your mortgage, you, you have a, a really big deal. Uh, you have a lot of stuff to deal with and you've um, the cost is very high. So you tend to search more and put more time and have a more intense search and an external, external search for information. Uh, whereas that's different if you're buying your son or daughter a dollhouse, right? Sure, maybe a dollhouse is a few hundred dollars, but it's not a few hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so worst case, you buy a dollhouse, your child doesn't like it, and you return it. Or you buy it, and it's not great, and you're out a few hundred dollars. So will you spend some time searching? Sure, you'll spend some time searching, but probably not months or years in the same way that you might when you're buying a home. Okay? Um, the next factor that affects our search process is what we call a locus of control. Um, those of you guys who are psychology students in the class, you guys have really studied about the locus of control. Um, and consumer behavior is heavily rooted in psychology. So uh, we, we get into that here just a little bit. But um, basically you have an internal and an external locus of control. Someone who has an internal locus of control believes that, hey, I have control over my actions. I believe that... Um, the decisions that I make make an impact on my life, right? And these are people who typically engage in more search activities. You uh, nitpick every little detail, you look at all kinds of um, information, you, you get lots of feedback from lots of different sources. You have an internal locus of control, okay? Whereas people who are more go with the flow, believe, hey, you know, external factors, it is what it is, fate, God, whatever it may be, um, it, things are going to happen the way they're going to happen. I'm not going to spend time searching, okay? Uh, those people with an external locus of control tend to search less for um, information and as they're making a purchase. So 
it's important to know individual consumers. Uh, do these people have an internal or an external locus of control? And how does that affect the way that we market to them individually? So to give you some examples, um, people do a lot of research before purchasing stocks. Those people probably have an internal locus of control. They believe that the decisions they make and the predictions they make um, will grant them with more money. So they do more searching. They have an internal locus of control. Whereas someone who invests in a mutual fund, uh, which is more unpredictable, um, tends to have more of an external locus of control because those external factors like fate will determine um, your investment. Um, going back to people who want to lose weight, um, especially at the beginning of the year, everybody's always downloading all the apps, exercising, dieting, joining gyms, because uh, they believe they can make a difference, make an impact on their waistline. So they have an internal locus of control, what they do, what they eat, um, how much they exercise, how much water they drink, all of that's connected. They believe that will uh, make a difference in their, their weight gain or weight loss in this case. They have an internal locus of control where someone who says, oh, hey, you know, family history, high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, I can't control this, it's just genetic. Those people probably have more of an external locus of control and that they believe they don't have control over their situation. Um, the last factor I want to talk about is actual versus perceived risk. I kind of alluded to this earlier with my house example, but the greater the risk, the greater you're going to search. That's why I put that in big red letters here. Um, and there are five different kinds of risk that we're going to talk about. We have um, performance, financial, social, psychological, and physiological risks. Um, and risks are important because the greater the risk, um, the more your purchase can be delayed, the more your purchase can even be discouraged. So um, it, it definitely does lengthen your search process. So I want to go back to my example about Katie. Remember our friend Katie who's searching for um, an outfit for her, her job interview coming up. As we talk about Katie, I'm going to use this to uh, frame each of these risk examples for you, okay? So when we talk about performance risk, Katie's worried about her outfit. Uh, you know, it, is this going to be something that I put in the dryer and it shrinks and I can't even wear it to the job interview? Oh my gosh, I should not buy that. Oh no, right? Okay, that's a performance risk. She's worried about the inherent danger in the product or service performing as it should. Um, Katie might also be worried about the financial risk. Um, and this is pretty easy to conceptualize. Um, oh my gosh, you know, I'm paying $500 for this new Brooks Brothers suit. Is it going to last? And is it going to last for a few years? Am I going to wear it to multiple interviews? What about church? You know, oh, oh my gosh, uh, how long is this going to last? Am I going to get my money out of it? Is it going to be worthwhile to me? in the long run or maybe from another standpoint what's the upkeep cost of this this item that i'm purchasing am i going to have to dry clean it um, do i really want to buy this item okay financial risk uh, there's also a little bit of a social risk and uh, like katie i always think about this as i'm purchasing clothes um, is this professional is it, is it too trendy does this make me look like a grandpa uh, i always ask that question in the dressing room to myself uh, does this make me look like a grandpa okay so those social risks those fears that um, you as a consumer you suffer and you, and you worry that people might not regard your purchase positively uh, those are social risk and those do impact our search process um, something else is safety risk so um, oh my gosh, I heard there was just a, a recall on Toyota brakes. Is my car, uh, when, when I press the brake, as I'm going down the hill, is it going to work? Or am I going to come uh, to a screeching halt? Um, you know, I, if you clean your bathroom with bleach, oh no, are those chemicals going to cause me to have cancer later in life? Um, all these things are physiological, or what I shorten to safety risks. And these are all things that are very important as you're purchasing a product, especially uh, your larger ticket items usually. Um, we also have psychological risk. So you've probably heard the expression at some point in your life of keeping up with the Joneses. Well, um, psychological risk refers to that. Um, it's the risk associated with the way that people feel if the product or service does not convey the correct image. So. Um, Typically, when people start to feel more vulnerable, they tend to equate uh, bigger with better. So we buy bigger TVs, bigger houses, we want larger portion sizes whenever we go to restaurants. Um, and people associate this with, some, with improved status or maybe even with happiness. So all these things um, are psychological risk. And all of these questions together delay the search process. Okay. 
<clears throat> okay, so after we've recognized our need and we have conducted some search efforts, we engage in what we call the evaluation of alternatives. And honestly, this, this occurs pretty naturally during the information search process. You, you know, we categorize things in our heads without even realizing. We say, oh, you know, this one's too expensive or this is nicer quality, but it's a little more expensive. Um, this product's better, this one's worse, or I'm definitely not buying that one. You know, we, we categorize all these things in our heads and kind of use this as we make decisions in the marketing world. So we have what we call attribute sets, and we're going to look at a couple different examples, but we have our universal attribute set, uh, and these are visualized here in circles for a reason. Um, the universal circle here, the universal set, you'll notice takes up the whole, the whole space. It encompasses all three circles together, and that's because the universal set includes all possible choices for a product, okay? Every single possible product out there is in your universal set. Um, your retrieval set includes only those brands or those stores that you can think about whenever you think about a product. And then the evoke set includes some alternative brands or stores that you maybe might consider when you're making a purchase, but it maybe isn't your, your favorite item, okay? So all of that probably sounds like gobbledygook. So let me give you an example to help illustrate these things, okay? So let's think about sodas, okay? Um, if I tell you right now, shout out all of the sodas that come to mind, and you go Coke, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, 7-Up, and you start yelling out all these products, that's your retrieval set. Those are all the ones, all the stores, all the brands, in this case, all the all the Cokes or uh, soda brands that can be brought forth to your memory immediately. Okay, that's your retrieval set. Uh, but the universal set is every single soda item that's out there, even the ones that we didn't name. So I don't even remember what I just said right now, but I don't think I said Dr. Enough. I don't think I said um, Mountain Dew. Okay, so all those products that are out there, um, every single soda product possible would be your universal set, whereas the ones that just came to mind when I said, hey, name all the sodas you can think of right in this moment, that's your retrieval set. Um, and then your Evoke set are those kind of alternative brands that you're like, yeah, I mean, I would drink that, but it, you don't really want that, but I, I would, I'm familiar with it, I've had it before, sure, I might drink it again. Um, that's your Evoke set. So we use what we call evaluative criteria as we are evaluating which products we want as we're sorting through the alternatives. We use evaluative criteria. Uh, these are different for every product, but they're essentially just important attributes for us that are important as we're making a purchase. And so going back to Katie, who's looking for her job interview, you know, she might look at the price, she might look at the way it fits, uh, the quality of the material, how reputable is the brand, you know, she's going to look at all those things. Uh, we also have what we call determinant attributes. So don't get confused. We have evaluative criteria and determinant attributes. Um, and the determinant attributes are really just what differentiates products from another. Um, maybe what differentiates a brand or a store. What sets that company apart and gives it a competitive advantage? And so to help you visualize this evaluative criteria, we have what we call uh, there's two different kinds of consumer decision rules. We have the compensatory and the non-compensatory decision rules. And as we look at these, um, the compensatory decision rule helps you evaluate all of those different criteria, and it helps you kind of make a trade-off. So an example of this, you know, if you're thinking about uh, wanting breakfast, like a little breakfast bar. I always have like Cliff Bars every day for breakfast. So the little breakfast bars. Um, maybe you're thinking about, you care about the taste. You know, am I going to like it? Is it going to taste good? You also care about the calories, maybe how much it costs, and you care about if it's natural or organic. Well, sometimes, you know, you have to prioritize all those things. You don't always get the best taste um, with the, the lowest calories, or you might not get the most organic product with the lowest price. So sometimes you have to make a trade-off. You have to pick uh, one thing and let that good characteristic compensate for the bad characteristic, okay? Hence why we call this the compensatory decision model. So, um, and we use a multi-attribute model occasionally to track these. If you work in marketing, you will definitely see one of these models. 
Uh, I'm not a huge math person, so I won't go into a ton of detail for you here, but basically you, you assign a weight to each factor. So going back to our granola bars, maybe you assign a weight to the taste, a weight to the calories, a weight to the price, and another weight to the natural and organic, and then you um, evaluate the importance of each factor. And all these have to add up to one or 100%, and you go with the one that gives you the most important um, factor, which, whichever one you determine as being most important. Um, but the point here is that you understand when you're evaluating criteria, we can use this compensatory decision model to help make a trade-off, decide what's most important, and use that as we're making a marketing decision. Um, the opposite of this is true when we talk about the non-compensatory decision rule. And this is whenever you say, hey, I care most about having organic products. I care most about it being grain-free and hormone-free. I, I want this totally organic product, so I'm going to spend the most money and I'm going to buy this product because it's the most organic. Uh, so you're not making a trade-off. You're, you're not compromising. You're saying, this is what I want, so I am purchasing because of this. So regardless of any value of any of the other attributes, um, you make a decision based on only one characteristic or maybe even a subset of a characteristic, and that drives your decision. Okay. So I have an, an, a little video here just to illustrate for you um, these two models, and I'm just going to show you this quickly. So please take a moment and enjoy this video. Thank you. 
Okay, so I hope this video helps illustrate for you um, just how we differentiate between these two models and how they can be used to help us evaluate alternatives as we're making decisions. Um, so, okay, so we've recognized our need, we've searched for information, we've evaluated alt our, our, ooh, excuse me, we've evaluated our alternatives, and now we're gonna make a purchase uh, or consume the product. So we call this step purchase and consumption. Wow, marketers are such creative people, right? So uh, this is the easiest step. Obviously, you're just purchasing the product. Um, we do look at what we call conversion rates as we um, are you know, analyzing this step in the process. And essentially, we just care about how well these purchase intentions have actually converted into purchases. Um, so we look at virtually abandoned carts. Uh, I'm notorious to, to do this on Amazon. I'll add something that I really, really want, um, and then I'll just wait and abandon my cart. So they look at virtually abandoned carts, uh, or maybe you've been in a real store and you walk by and you've seen a cart full of something that somebody's just left in the middle of the aisle and walked out. They use that as, we use that, marketers use that as we analyze um, purchase intentions of consumers. So. The very last step is what we call post-purchase, and this is exactly what it sounds like. Um, after you purchase a product, post-purchase, uh, there's three real outcomes. You can either be really satisfied, you're happy, you're feeling great. Uh, maybe you become a loyal customer. Man, I am so happy with the way Home Depot did my kitchen. I am always going to shop at Home Depot. I am never going to Lowe's again, right, or, or vice versa. Uh, you become a loyal customer. Um, or maybe you have some post-purchase cognitive dissonance, which is just a fancy way of saying buyer's remorse. You've probably heard that. So um, some ways we can deal with this, and, and if you want your customers to be satisfied, one of the best things to do, uh, you don't want to set super high unrealistic expectations of your product because that can lead to dissatisfaction. Uh, but you also don't want to set terribly low satisfaction expectations either uh, because that can re result in people not purchasing your product. So um, there's a fine line here. Some, some key things that you can do here to try to achieve satisfaction are, you know, again, setting realistic expectations, not too high, not too low, uh, demonstrating correct product usage, maybe through a YouTube video, uh, standing behind your product with some kind of warranty or return policy, encouraging customer feedback and comments. And also you can contact your customers to thank them for their support. Maybe send them a letter, send them a card, or hey, old fashioned, pick up the phone and call and say, thank you for your business. Are you happy with your purchase? Is there anything I can do to help you? Uh, these are all basic uh, customer service tools you can use to ensure satisfaction of your products. Um, as far as buyer's remorse or post-purchase cognitive dissonance, um, some things you can do again to help are verify the quality, show the quality of your product, follow up with phone calls, make sure you're um, following up with your customers, make sure they're still enjoying their product or their service, whatever it may be, thank them for their purchase. Um, the goal in the end is that you are developing loyal customers, okay? So maybe you're loyal to a certain supermarket, maybe you're a Kroger shopper, maybe you're a Food City shopper, Publix, uh, whatever it might be. You want to make sure that you have some, some kind of customer relationship management program to acquire and retain these loyal customers, okay? Uh, this is most common whenever you think of like a loyalty card, like a Kroger card or a Food City card, uh, because if you're a loyal customer, you're only going to buy certain brands and shop at that certain store, um, and, and there's really no other firm in your Evoke set. Whenever you think of going to the grocery store, again, you probably have a certain store that you go to every week. It's, it's the only um, grocery store in your Evoke set. You don't want to go anywhere else. So marketers really attempt to solidify that loyal relationship with customers. Um, okay, so we've come full circle now. You've, you've seen all, all steps of the consumer decision process. Remember, this is a big takeaway this week. You want to be able to talk about what consumers do before, during, and after their purchase decisions. Um, and again, this includes everything all the way from need recognition all the way to post-purchase. Um, okay, so we want now that you know about this consumer decision process, I want to talk to you a little more about the factors that really influence this process. 
And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these because I know that you can read through them, but I am going to just go through and hit the highlights. I don't want to keep you here forever for a two-hour video. I know that you do have lives and things to do, so um, you can you can read about this on your own time, but I, I will just briefly go through some of these. We're going to start with psychological factors, um, and, and there are five of these that are important. You've all probably read about um, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Um, so this is probably not a shock to you, but we do have psychological safety, love, esteem, and self-actualization needs. Um, these are all important and a major part of the consumer decision process. We also have attitudes. Uh, we define attitudes as a person's enduring evaluation of his or her feelings about um, and the behavioral tendencies toward an object or an idea. There are three different components of attitudes. We have the cognitive, affective, and behavioral components. Um, our cognitive component deals more with our beliefs, whereas our affective component is more about your likes and dislikes, your feelings, your emotions, and then your behavioral component deals with more of the actions that you take. Um, we also have perceptions, and our perceptions are important. You wouldn't believe this um, before studying marketing, but it's super interesting, just the colors that are on packaging, the symbols people use, um, all of these things reflect our perceptions of consumer goods and services. Um, you might also care more about, again, keeping up with the Joneses. So, oh my gosh, I want one because she has one, right? So these are all important. We also have learning and then lifestyle. Um, some people wanna live a certain way and spend your money and your time a certain way. Um, a good example of this is North Face jackets. So a lot of you guys being college students probably have a North Face or maybe have a Columbia. And um, a lot of that may be because North, North Face jackets are a trend. They're a fashion statement. Most of us do not purchase, uh, sadly, North Face jackets because we need that super great sufficient protection against the elements and the temperatures. We, um, you, you may hike or you may go to Antarctica, but... Uh, typically, these are more of a fashion statement here in our area, at least. So these psychological factors are important as you go about making these decisions. Um, the social factors are also very important. So uh, family is a big aspect of a lot of purchase decisions, um, and it's different for every product. So when you're going to a restaurant um, with your family, maybe you all talk about, oh, well, Italian sounds good. I kind of want Olive Garden. Oh, no, I kind of want a steak. You know, and maybe you, you make a decision all together and try to find a restaurant that makes every family member happy. Whereas uh, when you're searching for a new car, maybe it's just mom and dad who get the final say. So maybe they're not consulting all the children and all your siblings, right? Maybe it's just mom and dad. So family and social factors uh, can affect our purchase decisions. Um, our reference groups are also really big. And this is Super important for the millennial generation, but um, we care a lot about reference groups. You know, maybe you're reading a blog before you make a purchase. Maybe you consult your friends, your family, your coworkers. Um, these are very popular ways of evaluating our alternatives before we purchase. So these social factors are important. Um, of course, we talked about culture a little bit before. So obviously, you already know a lot about cultural factors and how these can impact your purchase decisions. Uh, my favorite thing to discuss and really study is uh, are our situational factors. And these are obviously the factors specific to a, a situation that influence our purchase decisions. Uh, one of the most common things to talk about is the purchase situation. So maybe you're a budget shopper, maybe you only shop in the bargain bin like me. Uh, but today, maybe you're buying a wedding gift for your best friend, so you're not going to go to the bargain bin. You're actually going to go uh, look for a nicer item paying full price. So uh, the purchase situation can impact, um, obviously, consumer behavior. The shopping situation can also make a difference. And I always ask people in my in-person classes, well, have you ever gone to a store planning on making a purchase and then you get just totally derailed once you're there? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that can change that, and, and these situational factors make a difference. Um, so maybe the salesperson is super aggressive, and you just it's overwhelming almost. It's just a big turnoff. You go in, and oh gosh, I don't even want to shop here now. This person's down my throat. 
um, <coughs> excuse me, or maybe um, we study what are called atmospherics. Um, you know, the music that's playing in the store or the scent, the lighting, the wall color. If you've ever been to Abercrombie and Fitch, you immediately know as soon as you just walk in the mall, you can smell the cologne. You know there's an Abercrombie and Fitch in that mall. Um, and, you know, there's a certain lighting in there. There's a wall color. There's, there's music playing. All of these things impact your your buying decisions, you know, Ikea, if you've ever been to the furniture store, Ikea, they have restaurants inside and some of them even have bars uh, because they want you to come and stay all day and they want you to experience their products and spend money in their cafeteria, in their restaurant and spend money on their products. And as you're checking out, grab a tasty cinnamon roll, right? They All these things are situational factors and atmospherics play a big part in that. Um, going back to aggressive salespeople, um, Apple, you guys will learn this semester, I'm a big uh, Apple supporter, but um, Apple is great. They have this uh, new technique, they call it, it's a five-point selling technique, and they use an acronym. Um, ironically, their acronym is also APPLE, right? A-P-P-L-E. Uh, the A stands for approaching customers warmly. Uh, both P's, we probe politely to assess customers' needs. We present some solutions the customer can do that particular day. Uh, the L, we listen and resolve worries the customer may have. And then E, we end by giving the customer a warm goodbye and inviting them to come back next time and purchase more of our products. So um, this has been proven to be very successful in the business world. Obviously, Apple's doing quite well. Um, so we see this five-point selling technique. Some other situational factors that may impact um, your purchase behavior while you're inside of a store is crowding. Um, I don't know about you, I cannot stand crowds. And you know, if you're in a store and there's hundreds of people, it can be very stressful. This is why I don't like to go Black Friday shopping, okay? Lots of crowding, too many people, or sometimes the store just has a lot of stuff. Maybe you've been in a store where it's just packed to the ceiling, there's too much merchandise, or maybe the lines are too long. Maybe you're in a certain store, I won't name any in particular, but maybe you're in a store and there's only one cash register and one person working and you are trying to check out with a whole cart full of items, okay? Uh, something else that can impact your buying situation are in-store demonstrations. Uh, Sam's Club is really good about this. You can go in Sam's and sample different foods and try different things. They do this because they want to attract consumers. Uh, promotions are also other forms of situational factors. Maybe there's a buy one, get one sale where you buy more than you typically would. Um, maybe there's a coupon available at the counter at checkout that you can scan. Maybe you have a coupon app on your phone. Um, there's this really cool app called Coupon Me Now that as I'm driving down the street and passing all these different retailers, uh, Coupon Me Now pops up with all these different advertisements and says, oh, there's 25% off at Kohl's as I'm driving by Kohl's, or oh, there's 10% off appliances at Best Buy or whatever. Um, so these are all uh, situational factors in the form of promotions that affect our purchase behavior. Packaging is also something that can totally change uh, your situational factors. So maybe um, if you've ever noticed Pringles, uh, they're just potato chips, right? But they don't come in a typical bag. They have a certain uh, can that they use. The Pringles bag, it's eye the Pringles uh, container, it's eye catching. So it, it helps as a situational factor encourage you to purchase. Uh, sometimes people just change their packaging in general. They just do a, a redesign of their packaging to try to um, stimulate further purchases, and we'll, we'll study more about that when we get um, into um, the later parts of the class, so I won't say too much about this now. Uh, the other thing are our temporal states. You know, if you are, um, you know, anxiety and depression is a real thing, and if you're having a bad day, maybe, um, you know, that, that mood swing can affect your behavior as a consumer. Uh, life in general can also just impact your your purchase decisions. If you get a parking ticket or you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend or you get a flat tire or you get rear-ended in the parking lot, uh, those are all going to affect your, your purchase decisions. Sometimes just the time of the day. Maybe you're a morning person or you're an evening person and you're those are all things that impact our, our purchase behavior, which is why marketing is so interesting. And uh, again, human beings are so irrational. We don't know uh, what's going to happen. So all these are important things. Um, okay, so as we put all this together, I'm going to kind of close here talking about involvement. And 
all these factors together, the four P's, psychological factors, social factors, situational factors, all these are impacted by the consumer's level of involvement. Okay, when we talk about involvement from a marketing standpoint, we're talking about the consumer's degree of interest in a certain product or a certain service. And you have, of course, high involvement and low involvement consumers. Uh, your more high involvement consumers, they tend to really overanalyze every little detail. They look at the quality, the material, the fabric, the price, everything when they're making a decision. They scrutinize all the information, okay? Whereas your low involvement consumer um, tends to just go through in a less thorough manner. Hey, all my friends have this. I'm going to buy it because they do. Or, oh, I'm going to buy Ralph Lauren. I don't want another polo. I want the Ralph Lauren brand. Um, or maybe there's a celebrity endorsement for a product. You know, oh, um, Tom Brady is using Nike products, so I want to do that. Okay, um, so high involvement and low involvement decisions. Um, as we look at these levels of involvement, we also have certain types of problem solving techniques. And uh, within um, this little subset, we have extended problem solving and limited problem solving. As we look at extended problem solving, this is more of what you're going to do when you're purchasing a house or a car, something that's a high risk decision. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Again, um, the more risky the decision, the more searching you're going to do, the more um, extended problem solving you're going to do, the more research. Okay. Whereas you're limited problem solving, you're probably just going to make a quicker purchase decision. You're not going to spend as much time delving into the research or put as much time and effort into it because maybe you have some prior experience with the product. Maybe um, it's only moderate risk. Um, under limited problem solving, we have what we call impulse purchasing and also habitual purchasing. Um, maybe you're making an impulse purchase because, oh my gosh, there's a new kind of Oreos and those Oreos sound spectacular. So you want to make this impulse purchase and grab the Oreos. I guiltily have tried almost all the brands of Oreos. Okay, so impulse purchases. You throw them in the cart. Hey, I'm excited to try these. Um, another type of limited problem solving um, can take place with habitual decision making. So uh, you know every single week that you buy Tide laundry detergent. So you're going to buy Tide this week because you know that you need it. Um, it. Or you buy Charmin toilet paper. It's something that you buy continually. You don't need to spend a lot of time researching it. Sure, maybe you look to see if Walmart or Kroger or the dollar store, you look to see who has it cheaper. Sure, maybe you put a little bit of time into it, but you don't sit there and read the label and evaluate and compare it against 10 other types of detergent. It's not um, extended problem solving. It's more of just a limited problem solving. So um, these are the, the key highlights for this week. And again, I did not hit every little detail. Just tried to hit the highlights for you because I know that it can be helpful to sometimes have the auditory there for you. So I hope this information has been helpful to you and I look forward to reading your discussions this week. And if you have any questions, as always, feel free to shoot me an email. Have a great week, everybody.